Mission and Margin is the business of healthcare. I'm your host, Matthew Hannes, founder and executive producer of the business of healthcare. In this BOH episode, Dr. Jim Stefancic of Raven Healthcare describes how payers and providers can use artificial intelligence algorithms to optimize treatment plans, medical spending, and patient outcomes. Raven's AI algorithms, based on a large patient database from Centerstone and AI technology from Indiana University, assist providers in making treatment decisions and then uses the resulting patient outcomes in a continuous learning cycle. If I'm chairing the med expense committee for uh, a payer, what is it that I'm going to get out of Raven Healthcare? So they want to know, hey, if I'm going to start putting care management resources towards some of these issues, especially mental health, I want to get a return on my, uh, you know, on this particular investment. They're they're the most um, the most in tune with looking at uh, at at being able to find a uh, a way to lower the risk. So. For them, I think that is one, what's one opportunity, is to put a tool in the hands of their care managers and then potentially drive that down to the, to the providers they work with. If they see these kind of tools working, they can recommend these kind of tools to the providers in their network. But we tend to be more of a provider-based tool, but the providers aren't necessarily taking on the risk right now. Dr. Stefancic previously helped found and ultimately sold Pathfinder Therapeutics, which brought to market image-guided surgical products. He has also served at Launch Tennessee and as a Vanderbilt University Medical Center research professor. He has authored more than a dozen peer-reviewed scientific articles. Stefancic earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Biomedical Engineering from Johns Hopkins University and Master and PhD degrees from Vanderbilt University. He is a distinguished alumni and adjunct professor of business at Belmont University, where he earned his MBA. This BOH interview was made possible by Foothold Technology, New Directions Behavioral Health, Raven Healthcare, and VPAC Clinical. Jim Stefancic, thank you so much for joining the business of healthcare today. Thanks for having me. So you're betting big on artificial intelligence. Tell me a little bit about what the work is that you're doing. We are, so uh, the name of our company is Raven Healthcare. And we are proud partners with Centerstone, one of the largest mental health providers in the United States, and Indiana University. And this is technology that was worked on for, for a number of years, really. Um, Centerstone had their own homegrown EHR, and we're starting to look at how do you make this data actionable? How do you make it more valuable? And mental health care is so complex that being able to use this data and drive better decision making was the ultimate goal. Talk about an example of that. Talk about a data set and, and, and what your algorithms can do. Right, so one of the first studies that was done with the data was to look at um, what is the right treatment for people suffering from depression. So they looked at a population of people suffering from diabetes and depression, and they were recording a metric called CDOI, which is similar to a PHQ-9. Centerstone had been collecting this information, and the idea was we need to find the right treatment for these people. We know they're depressed, but how do we find the optimal thing to do now for them? And how can we think of healthcare as a sequence of events and not just think of it as, you know, you do one thing or another and you hope for the best and you wait a long period of time. They had enough outcomes measures, which is key to our analysis. They had enough outcome measures around this to be able to say, we can actually predict the right pathways of care. So is it medication, is it therapy, is it a combination, or in some cases is it you do less, you do nothing for the patient. Sometimes you over, over treat these patients. And so that seminal study that came out in 2013 was kind of the basis of the technology and what kind of launched the company. And, and, and so the technology in essence is a set of algorithms, is that fair to say? Yes, it is, it is essentially finding answers to questions, optimizing the answer to the question, using artificial intelligence and machine learning. So it could be one algorithm, it could be two algorithms, it could be a number of algorithms that go into coming, in coming up with that optimization. But the key is, is we're using machine learning. So the algorithm's learning over time as it gets more information and it improves the outcomes, it improves the quality over time. So you're, you're a competitive guy. If I, it, we're in Gettysburg right now, and yeah. if I understand correctly, there's uh, across the street at Gettysburg College, you hold a record in swimming. I had the pool record 
many, I won't even say what year it was. I was a freshman in college at Johns Hopkins and I came up here for my first swim meet and I broke the pool record at Gettysburg. So, All right, so you're- so Gettysburg so you're, holds a special place in my heart. So, so. so, you, so you're, you're a competitive guy. Um, building those algorithms and delivering those algorithms to the market, who does that serve? Who wins? Well, obviously, number one, we're really passionate about doing this for the patients. You know, um, um, me personally, I've, I've, had, um, I've had chronic pain, um, and with that came, came mental health problems, and not being able to find out exactly what was wrong with me for so long, you know, me being a smart guy, going around, talking to different clinicians, and suffering from the pain and the anguish and the loneliness, I thought, there's got to be, you know, when I, when I saw what was going on at Centerstone, um, and I got to know the people, and I got to know this idea of we can use this to really predict and prescribe what's going on, the idea of having those answers available to the patient, I think, first and foremost, is, is our goal. And that, that the patient, ultimately, it'd be great if the patient could actually see these pathways of care and see that they're on the right track. Like every day is, you know, it's not going to be a straight line. They're going to get better and better. There may be bumps in the road. But to be able to predict this pathway and they're eventually going to get better, ultimately that would be what we would want to show the patient. Now, in reality, a lot of these apps and other things that are available for people with mental health, they're the, they're the people, people with mental health problems are the least likely to use this. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, we're thinking about the patient, but giving these kind of tools to providers and case managers to be able to drive better decision making for the more complex patients so they can try and get the right treatment the first time and be confident about telling that to the patient I think is really critical to our mission. It's almost like creating a GPS to help the patient navigate their care or help the clinician navigate the patient through care. Exactly. Um, you know, one, one analogy I've, that I've thought of lately around this is when you're driving in a complex environment, even if you really have a good sense of how to get from point A to point B, you may have done it a dozen times. Oftentimes you use your GPS. And why is that? Because what if you run into something unexpected? You don't want to have to think about the four other pathways, the four other routes you can take. You want to have them available to you so you have the time and the, and the, and the resources available to make the right decision. And to think, is this, if I go a different route, is, is that the right way? Have I done that in the past? And so that's really what we're trying to provide. It's really augmented intelligence. We're not really we in no way, shape, or form, especially with mental health, are thinking about replacing the, phys uh, replacing the physician, the case manager. The human-to-human the, the -human contact for something as complex as mental health is really important. It's just we believe there are answers in the data that will help drive the right pathways, that, that will drive the right intervention to, to help the patient. In, in this journey of uh, taking uh, algorithms that have been developed uh, and commercializing that into a business. Where has the greatest pull been? What part of the marketplace has been pulling on you to succeed? It's a great question. We, um, you know, we've obviously done a lot of customer discovery. Having been an entrepreneur, I know how important that is. We probably spent most of our first year of 2016 just going around and talking to the customers. And what we've really found is mental health providers get this the most. They are the most willing and able to, to, to respond to what we have. They have these challenges, they have the struggles. They may not be as at risk as some other potential customers, but what they do and what we provide, it, the, the linkage is so, is so tight that they tend to respond the most quickly to what we do. The, I think the challenge of working with them is a lot of them still aren't at risk. They're, they're, so, they're earning fee for service. Exactly. Yep. And so they say, hey, if you tell me to do nothing for this patient because that's the best thing, I don't get paid. So you know, we understand that that's, that's part of the challenge. But we all know value-based care is coming. Mm -hmm. The question is, is can we ride that wave now? Can we, can we stay in front of it enough, get enough people motivated and engaged to do this on the, on the, on, on the mental health provider side to be able to capture some of that market? So if I'm, if I'm chairing the Med Expense Committee for uh, a payer, what is it that I'm going to get out of Raven Healthcare? So for, for the payer market, obviously, they're the most at risk, right? They are actually starting to take on more and more care management mm -hmm. around, around their populations. So they want to know, hey, if I'm going to start putting care management resources towards some of these issues, especially mental health, 
I want to get a return on my, you know, on this particular investment. They're they're the most um, the most in tune with looking at uh, at at being able to find a uh, a way to lower the risk. So for them, I think that is one what's one opportunity is to put a tool in the hands of their care managers, and then potentially drive that down to the to the providers they work with. If they see these kind of tools working, they can recommend these kind of tools to the providers in their network. But we tend to be more of a provider-based tool, but the providers aren't necessarily taking on the risk right now. So we're in kind of this limbo mode. You, you, you have a three-sided market conundrum. Exactly. You, you, you yeah. need the payer to be at a stage where they're economically motivated to provide, to enable the provider to fund a capability like this. And, you said and, it much and, better than I did, yes. <laughs> you're <laughs> living it. in it, you're yeah. living and breathing in it. <laughs> yes. What, that, what, what do you think becomes the spark? What do you think, what do you think the moment is where those, those three dimensions come together? The provider willingly engaging in this augmentation tool, the payer wanting the augmentation tool, and your tools advance enough such that they have good value. Boy, Matt, if I knew the answer to that, um, you know, I would be sitting pretty right now. I think, um, I think probably the biggest challenge is the payers and providers deciding, okay, it's time for both of us to take on the risk. Yeah. Like we have to share this risk together. We have to work together to manage this data, to use the data to drive the decision making. And so I think until that moment comes, when they're truly aligned, when their goals are truly aligned. And we see that with some, obviously with some, with uh, um, clinical integrated networks, ACOs. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that happen. The question is, is how much risk are really people taking in some of those models, right? They're kind of getting to like, kind of play in the sandbox without worrying about getting sand in their toes or whatever, you know? And, you know, and so. I, I kind of wonder if the large self-insured employer might be with a place where that spark is. Yes, absolutely. Because they have the risk, they have an, a vested interest in those individuals, um, in many cases, very large populations. It, does that make sense? Right, and they're, you know, they're oftentimes managing very, very, you know, they have very, very large customers that are counting on them to keep the cost down. Mm -hmm. And those customers are innovative companies. You know, they're looking for innovation, right? So they're saying, hey, we hear in the market that AI and machine learning is self-driving cars, why are we not using this for healthcare? Yeah. They may even be companies that are using it in their line of business. Yeah. So they're probably wondering, why are we not using this to manage our patients better? What, what, what's missing here? Why is this model hasn't, have, hasn't changed? And, that, and, and there would be in that, I think, uh, this idea of, of optimizing resource usage. There, there's a resource utilization. If I'm a, if I'm a provider who's taken the risk of putting, say, a behavioralist into my practice, I've got to make sure that I've optimized that resource in some way. Exactly. The, not everybody needs a mental health visit. And oftentimes when you look at you know, intervention protocols with some ACOs we've worked with, that's always the first thing they try and do. And they wonder why these patients don't get better, they don't show up for treatment, and they're still very expensive. Well, it's because a lot of these patients, they, they probably don't need to see a mental health provider. Maybe a phone call once a week. You know, if we can pull that from their from their notes, if we can see the interventions that they do, whether they, um, whether they do a good job of tracking them or not, if we can see the different interventions that are done. I called Mrs. Jones to see how she was doing this week and we talked about her cat. We find that in the case notes, that may be all Mrs. Jones needs. And that's a lot less expensive than trying to get Mrs. Jones to show up to a mental health provider. And you know, depending on other factors about Mrs. Jones, who, how far do her children live from her? What, what neighborhood does she live in? Uh, what kind of what kind of social network does she have? Those are factors now that more and more that data becomes available. Then I think these these providers who have relationships with these patients, primary care providers, will will be able to get a sense of what's going to work for that patient, and the algorithm will confirm that. And if it means they have to talk to that to that behavioralist that's in that's in the clinic, there they, certainly they can do that. The work that you're doing is incredibly exciting. I wish you the best of luck. I, I love the passion that you have Thank you. very personally for it. So uh, I, I hope it's incredibly successful. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining the Business of Healthcare today. To watch, listen, or read other BOH interviews, visit bohseries.com or search Business of Healthcare in our red logo wherever you listen to podcasts.